Hi, this is Dee Dee Roberts, and I'm here with Jeremy and Bill at the Happy Hippie Jesus Show. Man, that's like three guests in a row. Maybe we awesome. can keep our show named what it is, and we don't have to add like other words. Or If we do, nobody will ever get it right. Oh. Do we want people to get it right? I don't know. I mean, your mom's already found us on iTunes, yeah. so... So, <laughs> what more do we need? I don't know. Ah, Dee Dee, it's great to have you with us and just to see you today. Before we dive in, I've got like the most serious question anyone could ever ask you. Do you think Jesus was a hippie? Because I don't. But Bill does. Oh, was Jesus a hippie? Sure, Jesus was a hippie. All right. Yeah. I feel like like some people just want to say that just to get at me, to get my goat. <laughs> well, if I had to pick between you and Bill and who I'm going to agree with, right today, it'll be Bill. All right, fine. All right. Is it just because Bill looks like a hippie? He is inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> and he did just return from Israel, so I don't know, maybe, maybe... And I'm feeling a little cool because I shaved my beard off when I got back. And it just feels weird, you know? But. <laughs> These things happen. So, Dee, tell me a story. It can be from the Bible or fictional or your own life. But tell me a story that kind of offers some insight into how you see Jesus. Well, I'll just tell you my conversion story, if that's all right. Sure. I was uh, uh, 16 years old. I was had joined the church, and I'd had... I guess it was a second or third conversion because, you know, as a United Methodist, there's not just one and done, is there? It It's over a lifetime. But I was at camp. We called it Senior High Institute in the North Indiana Conference. And I was there for, the, for a week of camp. And on the third night, we had what was called Commitment Night. And during commitment night, we usually, in late, right after dinner, there would be a drama and some preaching. And then we would be sent out for three hours of silence. And being the kid that I was, I assumed that meant that you were silent. I I kept the silence because that's what people told me to do. So I would be silent for three hours and and walk around the camp and pray or go back to my room and write myself a letter. These were all things that were suggested to us, by the way. It wasn't that I was clever enough to come up with activities for myself for three hours of silence. I later found out that not all my friends were silent during the silent time. They disappeared and, and were active in all manner of activities during the silent time. But at any rate, so I kept the silence and I got back to the auditorium and we began to sing. Uh, We were preparing for a communion service and an opportunity where people came forward and knelt and were prayed with or prayed over as they made their commitment. And I was standing in the auditorium watching some of my friends as they went forward, listening to the music, singing the songs, um, just worshiping, when I noticed a light that uh, came into the room and began to just rest on different people. And it was, it was somehow I knew that that was the light of the Holy Spirit. And as I watched the light, I also somehow knew that that light was full of love and unconditional acceptance and peace. And I watched my friends that the light had rested upon and how they were changing even as I watched that happen. And eventually the light came and rested on me. And I knew that I was completely accepted by God. I knew that Jesus had indeed died for my sin. I knew that I was loved, that I was empowered, that that my life would never be the same. That pretty much sums up what I think about the gospel and what it means to be a committed follower of Jesus, is a person who believes in that 
unending, complete love of God that allows you to love others without reservation, without condition, that empowers you to be different in the world, that calls you to draw a wide circle and open up a community where others can find that for themselves. So that's one of the primary stories of my life. That's a beautiful story. I I can't even be snarky now. (laughs) And that's not me, but as an elder in the United Methodist Church, what do you see as your emphasis in your call? Well, the verse of Scripture that has been my sort of missional verse is, and I'm not going to be able to name it right now, of course, because I'm talking to you, but where, where Paul talks about Jesus breaking down the dividing walls of hostility and that there aren't them and us anymore, but there's we. And so, it, you know, as I've been an elder now in the church for a good long time, it dawns on me that I've been an elder now as longer than I wasn't. And I still think that that's my job. I think my job is, of course, to preach the gospel, which is a gospel that breaks down dividing walls, that brings people together, that allows us to belong and allows us to live into a new reality, which is different from the lies that we tell ourselves and one another about who we are and what our value is, what our worth is, that the reality is that we are all of sacred worth and worth enough for God to die for. You're getting ready to go through a transition right now because you are leaving a conference position and going back into the pulpit. What I want to know in this transition, what are you most looking forward to about going back into parish ministry? Oh, that's easy. That really is easy. I am ready to be in a community of faith because I love people and I think that this life that we're called to live as Christians has to be lived in a community. And being on the conference staff is takes you, in one sense, out of community. You have to work really, really hard on the conference staff to have that sense of belonging, that sense of account, mutual accountability that is so real in the local church. And so that is the thing that I'm most looking forward to in going back uh, to, to parish ministry is building community with other Christians who, and all of us sort of muddling along, uh, trying to follow Jesus, trying to do what Jesus calls us to do and be the people that we're called to be. I think we just got another exclusive that conference staff is not Christian community. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I don't think that that's what I said, <laughs> but it may, may be, but I didn't intend to be that. We're just teasing you. <laughs> Bill is the stirrer of the trouble. Yes. Which is why he's going to be appointed to. I, we should not, we should not call church names or do anything like that. <laughs> mean spirited in our show. I'm, I'm going to get appointed to Rooster Spit, Arkansas. If that's a real place, that's a brilliant name. Uh, I guess when you say a word about like transition is hard, and whether you're clergy transitioning or lady changing jobs or just people moving, I mean, we all go through different transitions in our life. So, where is God for you in a, this time of transition and? What do you lean on in these times? That's a really good question. I, Well, first of all, obviously, as an elder in the church, I think the transition is all about God. I trust that the bishop and cabinet have been led by the Holy Spirit in making this change for me. And I trust that God is preparing not only me, but the congregation that I'm going to for this new relationship and this new chapter in our lives. I think God's all over the transition. For me, discerning that, discerning where God is in it, trying to find the places where there is life and where I see God at work, 
both in myself, but also uh, in the congregation and in the community surrounding the congregation. Where are those places that God is calling us to? That's not mine alone to discern, by the way. That'll be work that we continue to do the whole time that I'm with Asbury. But I think that that's that's important. But I also think it's important to do the hard work of, of you know, I've, I've been in the center for six years. It's the center in some ways is, is my vision and my baby for good or ill and getting ready to pass that off. So there's some, there's some grief involved and some anxiety involved, but also a whole lot of excitement because I think that, uh, I think I've taken it as far as I can take it, and I'll, I'm anxious to see in a good way uh, what what the next person will do. And I'm leading it, leaving it in such capable hands with Michelle Morris leading us as lead trainer and Kathy Hall working the work she's doing with laity. I just think it's going to be better. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to receive, you know, the Asbury congregation from Mary Hilliard and the and the good work that she's done. So it's all it's all of a piece. It seems so meta though that for the last six years as the head of a Center for Vitality, you've prepared pastors to right. transition. I've been teaching right. transition. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um yeah. Yeah, I'm the expert transitioner. <laughs> yeah. And so are you preparing this year's transition seminar as you prepared to transition to? Well, working on it, yes. Um, I won't be teaching, though. I'll be sitting at the table with my colleagues who are in the midst of the same kind of transition. I do feel some pressure, though, to kind of do it right. And, I, th- you know, I, I woke up the other night seriously in a cold sweat with having had a nightmare that, like, everything that could have gone wrong you know, and entering into the parish went wrong, you know, like everybody was mad and, and like the roof blew off and the, I mean, it was just everything. And I, so I'm aware that even though I don't live in that kind of anxiety all the time, I'm that, that must be deep down inside that I better do this right. I at least don't need to mess it completely up. So I'm, I'm working ahead, and I hope everybody that's transitioning this year is beginning to work ahead with some really basic stuff, trying to think of good questions to ask Mary as, as we meet together and do pass off stuff, asking myself kind of where are places that I can make early wins, and I can't know that just sitting here. But as soon as it's appropriate to begin to talk with church leadership about where are places, you know, that that things can be done that maybe needed to be done all along, but just kind of disappeared in the busyness that I can step in and say, hey, have you thought about this? I'd like to build momentum in the move so that things don't have to stop and then we have to start again. I've been thinking about where those places are. We have a new associate coming in, so who has not ever been in parish ministry before. Um, he's new, has wonderful skills uh, in leadership and discipling ministries, just hasn't done that, quote unquote, professionally. And so being a good, both a good supervisor, but even more so a good mentor to him, um, working with the staff. So yeah, I've, I've, I'm thinking a lot about it and trying to be very intentional. Also recognizing that there's a certain amount, amount of it that I just need to receive and, as a gift and um, not try to control. There is a gift to every time we receive a new appointment in that we get to look at how we transitioned the last time mm-hmm. and say, what could I have done better? and try to make this one a little bit better than the last time. That, that really is a gift. I remember many years ago, I'm not even sure if I was transitioning at the time 
or it was because I was part of the cabinet. I really don't remember, but I remember Bud Reeves talking at a transition workshop and saying one of the gifts of transition is you get to start over. You really do get to think back over your your schedule, your priorities, how you've been doing life, and and make some changes. And nobody knows any better except yeah. you and your family. So what are the things that you want, not only just transition-wise, but what are the things in your own personal life, spiritually, mentally, physically, what are those things that you want to do better? Because you get to get a fresh start at that, too. And so that's been part of my musings and prayerful consideration over the last few weeks. And you're involved in some other projects, too, like uh, the Spiritual Formation Academy. So why don't you tell us what is the Spiritual Formation Academy and maybe how you got involved? All right. I'd love to talk about that. I've been now for about 20 years involved with the Upper Rooms Academy for Spiritual Formation And this is a program that was developed, gosh, they just did their, I think, 40th anniversary of the Academy. A group got together after that had been very active in the Emmaus community and said there's there's needs to be sort of a next step after Emmaus. And it needs to take, it needs to allow people to go deeper and broader. And so they, they began to think about that. And in, I think it was 1986, the Academy for Spiritual Formation was born. And it is a rigorous uh, two-year, when they say academy, it's a two-year academy. It is eight retreats over the two-year period of time, uh, five-day retreats. Generally, you go to a retreat center, so each academy has its own name based on the place where it's meeting. There are usually 40 to 50 others in your academy with you that are fellow pilgrims. The rigor or the the routine of the week is based on a Benedictine model of work and prayer and silence and community. So um, two hours a day, you're in a lecture from people who are scholars in the field or that in the various fields of spiritual formation then for 2 hours a day during the day you're in silence reflecting on what you're learning from those lectures worship happens in the morning at noon in the late afternoon with eucharist and at night with night prayer followed by silence until the following morning everybody has their own room that's like a, like a cell for you. It's very monastic in that way. So you can do the reflective work that you need to do. And then you're also assigned to a group, a covenant care group that you meet with throughout those two years that become a group of about 12 that become your, your real family. And you go through all the ups and downs and ins and outs of, of processing what God is doing in your life and in the life together of that small community or in the larger context of the, of the academy. So that can be the best of times and that can be the worst of times. As it turns out, I've, I've participated in that two-year process twice. Once Early on in my ministry, it was a period of time that was Michael was transitioning into conference staff work. Um, our kids were very small. Uh, my mother had, had just passed away and my, my only living parent at that point. And I was um, at sixes and sevens and participated, went to the two-year academy knowing that I, I just needed to get my head back on. And it it saved my ministry and probably my life. I laugh now because I'm not sure I did the readings. There are at least four books to read for each week of Academy. Um, and I probably read maybe a fourth of the books that were assigned to us. I found out 
later when I went back the second time when I, as I was turning 50 and was at a very different place in my ministry, very settled, very happy. But thinking about how at 50, I had 10 to 15 more years, maybe, maybe longer, but you know, just in general terms, about 15 more years of active ministry ahead of me. And what did I really, what did I really think God was calling me to do to make those really count? And so I got back to the academy at that point, did do the readings and found out that lo and behold, there was a project to do. Well, I never knew about the project the first time going through. And I kept saying to people, there's a project? We have to do a project? So um, I laugh at myself over that because somehow I missed that on round one. But I got exactly out of it that I needed to both times. And in between and uh, the two academies and then since then, I've had the opportunity and the pr- real privilege of serving on leadership teams for five-day academies, which are kind of tasters for that two-year event. And the Upper Room sponsors those five-day academies all over the country. We've had four or five hosted here in Arkansas, and now In the last two years, we have established a group from Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, and we're working together to bring five-day academies to this little corner of the United States because none of us had quite enough people within our our annual conferences to to make a five day really viable. You know, you need about 40 participants and, and it's, it's costly. I mean, you're talking about a five day retreat. You do need our faculty just get a pittance for their time, but, but you have to get your faculty there. So at any rate, we have a five day coming up in September, September 8th through the uh, 13th. It will be at the Gray Center in Mississippi, and our faculty for that event are a theologian named Mary Earl, who is an expert in Celtic spirituality. She'll be talking about healing and the paths of healing, which include forgiveness and uh, solitude and healing, and then Our other faculty member is a pastor from Dauphin Way United Methodist Church in Alabama, Robbins Sims, and he'll be talking about New Testament spirituality and looking at the stories, primarily the parables of Jesus, what that can show us about our our walk and our relationship. The theme for that is... Um, make us holy, make us whole from a hymn that appears in the Upper Room Worship Book. And we thought was really apropos for the times in which we're living, particularly as United Methodists. How is it that God sets us apart so that we can create community? And always when you're talking about a spiritual life, you're talking about that inward journey that then takes you back out. If it doesn't take you back out into your work, if it doesn't take you back out into community, then it's not true spiritual formation. We're not talking about navel gazing here. We're talking about retreat and connecting to the most central, the core of our being, our true selves, so that then we can take that and be our true self out in the world that so needs that honesty and vulnerability and integrity. So well, we'll make Bill put a link to it in the show notes. Please do. Because Bill does all the real work on our podcast. Yes, all I right. do. You know, the, the Academy sounds suspiciously a lot like that youth summer camp you went to. You know, it, it does in mm-hmm. some ways it, um, a little less, um, a little less crazy at times, but yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
it does. I was going to ask you earlier, are you sure you weren't at like a, at a youth uh, detention center? <laughs> <laughs> well, call, call, being called Senior High Institute, it does kind of sound like that, doesn't it? Actually, it sounds like John Wesley himself named it. You know, it's, it's never well, anything it was, to it. Well, it was at Epworth Forest, and we used to stay in the cottage that was named after Barbara Heck, if that tells you anything. So, yeah. It was pretty. It was pretty Methodist. Yes. 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 But the academy is not limited to Methodists. Absolutely no. not. And in fact, on our on our leadership team, we have a woman from the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and we have a couple of people who are not on our leadership team but are part of our the supportive community around us who are Episcopalian. And uh, the camp we'll be staying at in Canton, Mississippi, the Gray Center, will be is an Episcopalian retreat center. So it's an ecumenical endeavor, definitely. Yes, and it's not just for clergy. There's a uh, mixture no. of. And in fact, when we had our we had our inaugural five day academy last year at Ferncliff Camp here in Little Rock, and. Over half of our participants were laity. So if, if you don't have a good mix of lay and clergy within the community, and males and females, it all works. But it's a, it's a lot better to have that mix, definitely. Now, do you have to go through a mass to participate in the, the academy? You do not, no. And I, as a matter of fact, I've never been on an Emmaus walk. People have found out about my work with the upper room and on occasion have called to see if I could be a spiritual director. I don't even know if I'm using the right term because that's how much I don't know about Emmaus. But I've had to say um, no because I've never been on a Ma- on an Emmaus walk. Um, sometime I hope maybe I'll get that opportunity. Just go at it backwards. Why not? Exactly. But no, you don't have to you don't have to have graduated from the Mayus or attended a Mayus. You don't have to have any special skills. You don't have to have read forty seven textbooks on spiritual formation. You don't have to know some of the you don't have to know the jargon like Lectio Divina or or contemplative prayer or centering prayer or you don't have to know anything you just have to, to go on a, an academy you just have to be seeking after a deeper relationship with god that's all you need to go on an academy yeah and you don't even have to notice if there's assignments you don't <laughs> evidently not <laughs> you don't have to evidently do you don't have to do the project or read the readings or anything you just have to you honestly you just have to show up was, was that what seminary was like for you, D.D.? <laughs> no. No, no, no. No, I did read that and do the assignments. I did do that. But I think that's probably true of a lot of things in life. If you show up and you're really there, something God will do something marvelous. Now, you said there was a cost involved, not just time, but financial. Does the upper room offer any kind of scholarships to people that mm-hmm. might not be able to afford The upper room does not, but our annual conference has underwritten this, and so there is some scholarship available. The cost for this retreat will be $650 for the week, and I remind you that's, you know, five nights plus all your meals plus these two speakers. It's a, it's, it's a good deal, but it sound, but it is a, it is a lot like anything like that that you would do. And for those who have need, um, if they'll contact me, I will talk to them about about the scholarships that are available. I had to ask because I'm pretty sure the only reason anybody listens to our podcast is because it's free. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> could be, could be. No, and I guess. I went. Uh, I was at the five day academy at Ferncliff, and I got a lot out of it, and considered it well worth the cost. How has being involved in the leadership and the faculty shaped your understanding of Jesus, or how has your understanding of Jesus shaped what you do as the leader? You can take that question either way. Boy, that's a great question because I'm having a hard time answering it. It's easier to go at it from how has my understanding of Jesus shaped my involvement in the academy yeah. again. This idea of forming a community of people 
who really are who really want to follow who really want to be disciples and sit at Jesus feet and learn from him and in turn then share that learning with each other which in turn go out and do what Jesus told us to do to make disciples so it's all tied up for me in the great commandment and the great commission that calls me into the academy community. How has it shaped my understanding of Jesus is I have learned so much and I've learned, I've watched how Jesus has worked in people's lives through the academy. I've watched how people's journeys have taken a, a different turn because of that intentionality of, showing, really showing up. I've known people that have been called into ministry through the academy, people who have been called out of parish ministry and into a new form of ministry. I've seen people whose relationships have been transformed. I've seen people physically healed throughout a two-year journey with academy, either by them changing their lifestyles or, or in once in one case, a truly miraculous healing took place. And all of that, you know, talks to me or teaches me about who Jesus is, you know, healer of our every ill, hope of our tomorrow. It's hard to put it into words, but I am shaped mm-hmm. by that. My ministry has been shaped by it. So we've got a question we've been asking lately. What is it right now that's saving your soul? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Well, we're in the season of Lent, and I decided this year that instead of giving something up, probably because I'm a weenie, that I would take on a new discipline. And I really prayed about that. And what I ended up doing was I've taken on the discipline of reading poetry, particularly Mary Oliver. So I've been reading Mary Oliver's poetry throughout this season of Lent alongside scripture and spending more time in in silence. And that is, that is really, that's feeding my soul, saving my soul, opening me up in new ways. And I have to, and, and although I didn't think of it this way, it is, it's really helping me to start preparing uh, for preaching again. You know, I haven't preached regularly for 10 years, and I'm used to, I've been doing teaching, which some preaching is teaching, but I haven't been steeped in those kind of images and homiletical language that is different than standing up and doing a presentation, right? And so that I've started to think, I'm beginning to think like a preacher again instead of a trainer. And I don't want to draw too hard of a line between those two, but I think you might know what I mean. You know, when you teach a Bible study, you're doing something different than when you're preaching. And for me, 10 years, I've been teaching that Bible study or creating this curriculum and not doing so much preaching. So that's been something fun happening inside of me to feel that. It's sort of like the boiler being turned up, turned up, turned up, and the heat rising. And gosh, look out, Asbury, here I come. (laughs) So, you know, what can I say? I won't make you recite a poem, but do you have a title of one of one of Mary's poems that comes to mind immediately? Oh my goodness, so many. And I'm not going to, I may not get the title right, but she has a, I think it's just called Geese. So many of her poems are steeped in nature. This poem particularly deals with the gaggle of geese and the noise. And what are you going to hear in the noise? You're about to hear a lot of noise going back in the parish. (laughs) (laughs) I think so. I think so. I'm looking forward to it. Didi, is there any way people can contact you or follow you on social media? And we'll put this in the show notes. You don't have to spell anything out. Oh, okay. Well, of course, my by email, 
cell phone, all of that is on a conference website. You can get in touch with me that way. I do have a Facebook page, and it's just Dee Dee Roberts. Nothing nothing fancy with that. Another thing that I'm doing for myself is I've been uh, working with Day Davis on our staff, and she's teaching me how to do Instagram. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to being a presence on Instagram, I think. No, Instagram is a happier place. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a happier um, place. So, um, I'm looking forward to that. So, but I don't have an address or or a or a it may not be an address. See, I'm so ignorant. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Look for me on Instagram in a week or two. How's right. that? Oh, sounds good. And then the five day or the. Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas academies have their own website as well. You can to in order to register for uh, our five day academy, you go. You can go to the Upper Room website and uh, click on their community page, and that's how you'll get the link to register. Or, of course, contact me, and I can send you the registration link directly. Perfect. So. And Bill will put that in the show notes. Good deal. Because he does all the real work. I will make sure, <laughs> Bill, that you have the right information for that. Rock on. Thank, right. thank you, Dee Dee. We yeah. certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. Know, you. Thanks, I've enjoyed it, too. Awesome. Yeah.